Well, uh, first of all, thanks, Bill, for the, the introduction. And thank you all for, for coming here to listen uh, to my talk. And also uh, thank the organizers, uh, Wildlife Conservation Network and Chicago Zoological Society for giving me the chance to tell you about what I do in my part of the world and uh, next to amazing people that are doing great things locally to uh, protect wildlife. So, uh, okay, this is me and um, uh, it's gonna be my pleasure for 30 minutes to take you to my country, Peru, and to take you to my favorite place, Punta San Juan. So uh, Peru is located on the coast of South America and off of the, the, the coast of Peru is the Peru or the Humboldt Current. So the Humboldt Current is, cold, is a current of cold, nutrient-rich water that flows from uh, Antarctica, or the, the South Pole, towards the equator. And it's cold, very cold, nutrient-rich water. It's uh, one of the four upwelling currents in the world, so that already makes it pretty special. And thanks to all those nutrients and upwelling, we have in Peru a very a small schooling but very important fish called anchoveta or Peruvian anchovy. It's very important in our ecosystem. And just to orient you guys, Punta San Juan is here on the south part of that coast of Peru. So anchovetas or anchovy. Uh, in my country, this fish is very important. One of the Peru's most important, um, it's uh, the one of the three most important uh, sources of the economy come from fishing anchovies. So uh, Peru is uh, the, the country that fishes the second largest fishing nation in the world. First is China, uh, fishing many fish in different parts in international waters. And then comes Peru, fishing only anchovies in front of the coast of Peru. So that's a lot of fish. And you can imagine the amounts of fish that, so we can, that can feed all the wildlife and also, well, obviously the, the country's economy, right? And, and uh, it's, uh, the anchovies there because of this upwelling. And Punta San Juan, which is right here, is also has a very special location. And uh, you know, we have this very uh, strong uh, cold current, nutrient-rich waters. So Punta San Juan has a, the particularity that the, the distance from the coast to here, to this line here, that's the trench, so where the, gets really deep, right, in the ocean, is super close. So that means that in Punta San Juan, we have strong winds on the coast, we have very cold waters, and we also, uh, for if you're a fur seal, a penguin, or, a, or any kind of seabird, it's like living very close to a buffet. So we have right, the opportunity to go make a short trip out, get food, and come back and feed your chicks or your pups. And that's very important. So uh, a lot of productivity. And it's not only this penguin that says so. There's been researchers that have recognized uh, Punta San Juan as the most productive site in the Humboldt Current and one of the most productive marine locations in the world. Uh, and that brings, gives, uh, because we have this productivity and, and this site, we, we have large amounts of animals that are breeding at Punta San Juan. So there's three species of seabirds that nest together, the red-eyed cormorant, uh, the Peruvian booby, and Peruvian pelican, the largest species of pelican. They all nest together in very large aggregations. These are all birds. We'll zoom out, birds, birds birds from the drone. So yeah, this is uh, about 300,000 birds. This is one bird. So uh, we have to imagine the amount of fish that has to exist so that these birds can live and reproduce and feed their chicks, right? So it's pretty amazing. And uh, Punta San Juan is also home to the largest uh, breeding colony for Peru of humble penguins, and the second largest in the world. So penguins are also around in big numbers in the desert, very a particular place to see penguins. Uh, we also have South American fur seals, and it's one of the top three sites for, for these guys, also in pretty large numbers. <coughs> Sea lions, South American sea lions. They also like to pack densely and hang out close together in beaches of about six 
thousand and one beach. So it's pretty amazing. And these guys are not only there, so they're there because there's food, like I'm telling you, the, the upwelling, all this, but there's also been a, a long-term effort of protection at Punta San Juan. And this has been due to guano. So you guys know what guano is? <laughs> yes? Who says it? <laughs> bird poo, right? So bird poo is also very important in my country. Uh, the economy in late 1800s depended on bird poo heavily. We used to export this as fertilizer all over the world. Here's an ad from 1900s of uh, guano that was being um, advertised for, for North America. And this here, whoop, let's see, this here is what we call the guano pichu. So this is a <laughs> eight story high mountain of guano piled up on an island not at Punta San Juan, another island, another guano site. But you see, these are people, these are carts. So it's about eight stories of guano. So again, imagine the amount of, of birds and the amount of fish, right? Incredible ecosystem. And that has given place to guano harvests, or the extraction of guano from these places, and these um, activities that still go on today. So this involves at least 400 men going to islands or peninsulas to, to um, get this guano and, and get them off the islands. So because of this uh, activity of the, of the guano extraction, uh, the Peruvian government in 1909 already created the Guano Administration Company that was already made with the purpose of recovering seabirds. So they had already seen uh, this, this uh, a change in the number of birds, and there was already a concern for, conser for conservation. And millions of birds means, means millions of poop. So this was important for the economy. And here we have numbers of birds and the years. And what the country, what the government did was first put, had a couple strategies to improve the numbers of guano birds and put guards on islands and then walls on some of the peninsulas that they thought if, that, if they were protected, then the birds would like to nest there and more birds and more uh, guano to be sold, right? So that's how the story of Punta San Juan begins. This is an aerial photograph of Punta San Juan. That's this peninsula without the wall, without the town of Marcona that now exists. Uh, and this is the picture after, now with the wall, here with the red line, and here is Marcona. So uh, this wall, uh, although it sounds, you know, you just put up a wall, became very important for conservation. This wall was built in the late 1940s with the purpose of keeping predators and people out and keeping the wildlife in. Uh, in 2009, uh, the Punta San Juan, along with other 32 sites, have become part of a marine protected area network uh, on all of Peru. And so they're protected. This is the land here. This is the map of Punta San Juan the wall, and this, they also have a marine uh, protected area around them. So now, after all those years of the protection from guano, we also have another type of protection, which is neat. And here's Punta San Juan as with its in the system, the network system. But sometimes protected areas or on paper or all these pretty maps aren't enough because there's a lot going on in the ocean, right? And there's an example of, hmm, Maybe that will ate something, but there's a lot more going on, right? And we're interested in, in looking at that. And, and in Peru, um, something that is constantly changing year to year is the environment in the ocean. So here we have how um, these are the anomalies from average temperature in the water. This is just a time series, and it, all it says is that some years are cold and some years are warm. And we had two years in 82 and in 97 when it got really warm, and this is the famous El Nino. El Nino is that when uh, the water gets too warm, changes all of, the, of what's normal in that ocean, right? So anyone that's used to anchovies that live at a certain place in the water column or penguins that know how to eat those anchovies, everyone has to change their behaviors in, April in order to survive. I'm going to show you now uh, what happened 
in the 97-98 El Nino. This is a, a animation of temperatures on the, on the Pacific. And red means hot. So this is red, 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 red. And what should be normal, it should be light blue. It's the coast of South America, right? So normal, it got very hot for too long. And that meant no, uh, none of the normal prey for these animals was around. And that, mean, that meant that um, they had to take longer dives, deeper dives to get the food that they were used to getting. And that means uh, mortality if this event lasts too long. So in Peru, before El Nino, these are the population numbers for fur seals, sea lions, and penguins after El Nino. So that meant a reduction of about between 75 to 85% in these species. And that's a lot, and that just happens from one year to the next when the big event comes. We have to remember El Nino is normal, and it's been around for hundreds of thousands of years, right? Uh, but because the, when those numbers drop so low, it's because there's other things that are obviously making these populations lower or not allowing them to grow. So at Punta San Juan, we had at least the, the, the luxury of already having some research being done there. And when these populations got, uh, were more endangered or vulnerable, more monitoring, more conservation, capacity building, and education at this site uh, since at, from f after that of uh, decline in the population to actually uh, help recover them. And you know, those long-term data sets and being at one place for a long time and building on what others have done before you allows you to have, be able to tell some amazing stories I can tell you guys today. So this is one of the stories from Punta San Juan and this is just numbers of fur seals, and these are years. This is a, one of our main study beaches for fur seals. Good job, guys, just concentrate here on the maximum. So, you know, we have da, 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 nice years of well, this numbers of fur seals. It dropped a little bit, but then this arrow here is that 97, 98 El Nino that basically wipes out that, that breeding rookery. Good news is you leave that beach protected alone, Animals, especially many marine coastal animals like seabirds and pinnipeds, like to come back uh, to their, their, their breeding grounds. And there's been a great recovery at that beach since. This is kind of visually what happened. This is a shot of the beach. This is a picture from the 90s. This is after the El Nino, same spot. This is 2006, somewhat of a recovery. This is two weeks ago. So we're doing good. And in Punta San Juan, that also not just happened at one beach, but these are the beaches that had these fur seals in 2003. And this is 2014. More beaches with fur seals, even one outside the reserve, which is great. But um, the, the thing about that is that that happened at Punta San Juan, but the other sites where the fur seals had declined in the other parts of Peru, the fur seals have not come back, and Punta San Juan holds one third of the whole population of these animals. So there's other things going on that are affecting these populations. And this also tells, also just an example, uh, if we go way back, and I'm a big believer in going back and understanding when ha what happened uh, before me, is that um, these seals, for example, fur seals, get their name because they're hunted for their pelts um, in, in, well, in many parts of the world. They were hunted for their pelts. And in Peru, this is just to show a little bit of what happened and in, in the threats that they've been, uh, uh, they come against. So their commercial hunting for pelts was banned in Peru in 1959, but then illegal poaching has continued since. And the thing is that it was, if commercial hunting was banned in 1959, that anchoveta fishery develops in the end of the 1950s. So then you have, you know, they stopped killing them for their fur, but you have now a source of competition and bycatch. And we can't forget El Ninos, because they keep happening all the time, and that's natural. And then we have an MPA system that's new. But the time frame, right, and these are the populations are constantly, uh, um, 
have to uh, adapt and try and grow against these effects. This is another story. These are seabirds. Seabird numbers are in black here, and the blue and the red are fish landings. So all this story says is that, again, this is the industrial uh, chaveta fishing. Once it develops, start catching more and more and more fish. There's a moment here when the seabirds just plummet, and they haven't been able to recover. So again, it's uh, other threats besides. So if you have El Nino and fisheries, it's a lot that you have to, that you have to deal with. And there's other threats that we know of. Entanglement, sources for entanglement, fishing lines, uh, coastal, well, in, in industrial development, coastal developments and the waste in our oceans, right? We can have oil spills. Chicken farms are also a big thing in Peru, uh, and they're actually on the coast. And there's different species that can serve also as vectors that can, for disease, between things that can be going on and disease can be going on in this chicken farm. And this Andean fox slips into the reserve and can also be uh, transmitting different disease and that can go into mortality. So it's complex and we try and understand that and tackle the things that can help these populations. So we do that through a lot of wildlife monitoring on site. And on land, uh, what we do a lot is count things, count these animals. So it seems pretty straightforward. You grab your tally counter, your binoculars, a field notebook, and you need a lot of patience. I see some training that we'll give you in the field. Go work with us. But this is what we see through binoculars, <laughs> right? So that can get a little confusing. And then this is what we do. So these are sea lions, and these are fur seals. And Susanna wants you to know how many bulls how many females, how many subadult males, how many yearlings, and for each one of the species, because that helps us also understand how that population is doing. So it's not that simple. Penguins, a little bit easier, but we also count them according to their age classes, chicks, juveniles, and adults. And the good thing is that people are still working with us and counting happily on the cliffs. And uh, they, the, all this data together is helping us tell also a nice uh, story of recovery since 2001 after that crash for El Nino. These are first seal numbers that have recovered and we have about an 89% increase in recovery. So that's good news. And then the sea lions have a little bit of a different story. But if we just look at the trend of the maximum, we can also tell that they've recovered in the last few years. This is all for Punta San Juan. And the penguins the same. So that data allows us to understand good years versus bad years. And there's a constant effort in the field to, to uh, count these animals and understand how they're doing. We also have certain study beaches that we use to understand, for example, how many pups or chicks are being produced each year. And because uh, we've been these last few years, for example, 2012 and 2014, we've been on an El Nino alert. Right now, we're on one, too. And uh, those years, of course, we have less production of these chicks compared to 2013. That was a better year. So all these are indicators that on land allow us to say, hey, you know, if there's El Nino going on, we can say, hey, fisheries, it's not a great idea to catch so much anchoveta because uh, we need to leave some for the penguins and the seals, right? And in the water, there's also, uh, we do other types of things in getting our feet wet to understand what the animals are doing when they're out at sea. So we're doing that uh, with a little bit of technology just like others are using camera traps, we're using biologging. It's basically using GPS or satellite transmitters on animals to understand what they're doing in the water. So penguins get um, a GPS with a TDR, a little combination, a little uh, technology uh, strapped on their back. And uh, we work with breeding penguins that are nesting, and they have either chicks or eggs. This is the result from that. Here's Punta San Juan. This is the protected area in that blue polygon. And these green lines here are the trips, the feeding trips that penguins who had chicks did. And the red lines here are the trips of those 
who were just incub who were incubating eggs. So neat stories. The penguins come back. We get the data from the GPS, and we're learning things like yeah, like the 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 ones with chicks are making shorter trips, probably because they have a little one at home. Beep 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 beep. They say driving the partner crazy. You know, food 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 food, and and um, the the one that's that's going out to sea has to come back quick and feed that, that hungry chick. Whereas the ones with eggs have a partner, an adult partner that has reserves, they can stay in the nest and make a longer foraging trip. The other little equipment that they had on their back was a time depth recorder. So this is something that's going to measure the pressure as they do their dives. Because in the ocean, right, we have that spatial, but we also have the depth component. So this is an example of a track and the, the dives that they're doing. And if we just zoom in into one of these little bars, the data looks like this. It's kind of horrible. This is the, you know, the surface, and this is how many meters they're diving. So we say penguins, they look so cute on land, they you know, like kind of waddle, and, you know, but when they're in the water, these guys, so this is 69 meters here. That's about 200 feet is what they're diving. And so they're built for water. And they can do amazing things in the water. And we're understanding where it is that they like to eat most. Because if you like to eat, get most of your food for maybe 20 to 30 meters in the water, and there's a fishery that's throwing gill nets in 20 to 30 meters in the water, our hope is that we can show use enough data to show uh, fisheries that hey, maybe if we just don't use these nets during when chicks you know, need the food the most at a critical point, uh, we can help penguins out. Uh, another animal that's been a volunteer for science is uh, a South American sea lion, subadult males. So this is a completely different story, but it's, it's um, it's a lot of fun too because we picked these guys because subadult males are not breeding and they can do it's just like any bachelor male they can do anything they want go anywhere they want and they have no ties to anything so these guys uh well they this is where they went so we had some go up to paracas this is a reserve a little bit north of punta san juan not very far one of them went to chile and Mike and Susanna stayed at Punta San Juan. So this is uh, all the sea lions that, that, um, that we tagged that one year. This is another set of data. And the thing is that the ranges where they're moving are very similar. And it's uh, surprising because this animal has the capacity, like you know, sea lions in other parts of the world that migrate and do big trips, very long trips, these guys don't have to because food is close by. And the same thing with the uh, bulls for, for fur seals. Uh, they had finished their breeding season. They got a tag also, and they left. And they uh, did not have to come back for anything. And they also stayed pretty close, around 220 kilometers from the site. Uh, we've also done some work with GPS on boats with uh, fishermen. And this is a little. Um, map. Here are the polygons. Here are these blue uh, polygons are a lot of the fisheries that are, it's their traditional fishing areas. They're very coastal. But then these lines are another type of fishing um, activity. These are flying fish eggs that they go uh, to get for sushi. And uh, the thing is that these areas overlap. If we see the previous maps, you know, all these maps together, they, they overlap for where the predators are. So our hope is now to work together with the fishermen on the boats to try and um, understand also the, how, that, how the animals and the fishermen are interacting in the water. If we zoom into the Punta San Juan area, here is the protected area. And these are fishing grounds. So the same. There is activity going on um, all, all around the, the marine protected area. And so when animals are in the water, they, they're interacting with, with a lot of things, right? Not only uh, fishermen, but there's also, there could be a red tide. 
maybe they don't find food and they get nutritionally stressed or disease from other animals and other species and whatnot. So also to try and understand what's going on behind that. Uh, we'll work with uh, Dr. Michael Agusson here from uh, Chicago Zoological Society and he comes down every year to check on the health of these animals and these other cute animals. <laughs> That's why we put that picture in. That's why <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of work. It's a different than a zoo setting uh, and it's capturing animals, you know, carefully anesthetizing them. It's amazing work that goes on and a bunch of samples that are collected from each one of these animals. And a lot of people that are trained, um, that get trained on ground from Peru and, and people that come and, and help us out. It's really amazing work. We're collaborating with different researchers to analyze all those <coughs> samples. And so that was um, uh, with fur seals and with sea lions, it was a little bit more of a challenge because Sea lions, uh, they, I showed you some pictures of these beaches that are also very densely packed. And these animals, although they're huge animals, they're very skittish. They're very scared uh, of you from land. So uh, you can't just approach these animals. And uh, you basically have to hide between rocks and dart them. And that's what Mike does when, when he's down there. And um, this was the first animal that got uh, anesthetized, darted, anesthetized, and, and that was worked on. And these are um, the first successful immobilizations for this species in Peru. And, and the methods are, are great, and they're working out amazingly in the field. And we, this has made all this work and the work on these protocols and this developing these protocols uh, are allowing us to put those tags on. So it's win-win. So we're getting good at it, doing two at a time. So here we go, the tags on two animals. And this is the first seal, getting his tag to a bull. And um, all this work and interacting with different people and people from different places and collaborators allows us to do a lot of capacity building for Peruvians as well. We have uh, volunteers. We have students uh, that work with us in the field, get trained. Uh, Everyone's trying to do science all the time. That's my job. I'm after the students, and we're trying, uh, and we're 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 definitely a reference for um, this type of work in Peru, which I'm proud to say. And another great aspect, which I've heard uh, a lot about here today, is the community outreach. So I told you guys about the wall, and the wall has been amazing for conservation. But for the people living in Marcona, the wall is also a divide. For this, for this reserve, right? Because imagine um, being li living in, in a town where there's a wall and there's something behind the wall that, that you don't know, you just don't know what's there. For people in Marcona to come into the reserve, uh, you had to go to Lima, 700 kilometers away, to get a permit to come in here. So what we're working on now is uh, something called building bridges with Punta San Juan, and it's a the goal is to connect people of Marcona with nature through the reserve. So we do three things. We do educationally guided tours to Punta San Juan. We do activities with the community, and we have youth training. Uh, we've been working for the last 15 months. We have over 500 people already going to the reserve. Uh, many people that are participating in in our activities and also all smaller groups of, of youth that are being trained to be leaders in Marcona on environmental issues. So our guided tours involve people getting signed up, filling out surveys. They, they, the whole tour is based on education and information. They're there with a biologist. They're using binoculars. They're observing from distance because Punta San Juan, the beauty of it is that you can see natural behavior uh, in, in, in front of you from a distance, but you can see natural behavior, which is, which is amazing in a natural setting. Oops, I think it's, okay, and the community, the communi community, the activities with the community are very, they can be things from having a, 
um, sand sculpture contest at the beach or watching uh, penguin documentaries outside at the main square or a, a craft workshop with recycled material. Everything has to do with the ocean in different ways. And our youth training involves a small group of, of teens that we work with and we, we talk about all the environmental issues around Marcona and what they can do. Um, they get special extra visits to the reserve and what they could do to do something for the environment for Punta San Juan from their place in their, in their town. And one of the other great things about this collaboration between uh, Chicago and Disney is that uh, we've been able to hire Milusco, which is an anthropologist from Marcona that's working with us, and she's our main bridge to the community. So our current direction is strengthening those local partnerships with the community, with uh, City Hall, with different organizations, and working in alliance with the local fishermen for the marine enforcement of this reserve. Uh, and also to replicate this example throughout the coast, right? Punta San Juan is not alone, it's part of a network, and the idea is that we have these great lessons from all these years that we're working there, but they can be replicated along the coast. And the thing is, uh, right now, we're, I've told you a really great, I think, uh, you know, successful stories of how these populations have recovered, but at any given time, we can have an El Nino. And again, that's normal for us. And right now, if you guys look up the El Nino, there's a big blob of warm water going close to my coast, and we're on alert again to see if you know what's going to happen with penguins, what's going to happen with sea lions, what's going to happen with fur seals. And we understand that this is a normal, it's 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 natural occurring phenomenon. That what we want is to help boost those populations so that they're at a healthy level for when El Nino comes and so that they can recover again, because that's always been the case in the Humboldt Current. A lot of food, and sometimes you have El Nino. The thing is now we have fisheries, we have all these other things, and I think um, we're, this is what we're trying to do to, to keep these populations up. Uh, and last but not least is serving as a model to do sustainable tourism and conservation for um, the rest of the coast within this system. So that's it for me, and I'm happy to take any questions. If there's time, I'm like, sure. <laughs> Oh. What might we, um, we dream of that experiment, of the closing the fishery for maybe two years even. I think and, and that's, there's a lot of talk of that, of just two years with the Antoeta fishery to see how at least the, the birds will, will rise because the ecosystem is so intensely, like the Antoeta, it only takes a few months for, them to, for you to have adults. So you can have a great food source really fast if the, the conditions are good. So um, I think it would, it would be a great exercise, but that's where the industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Uh, the, the amount of guano seems huge. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you had any idea what the nutrient consequences of that are for the ecosystem, apart from being, it being harvested. Oh, you mean like the, the, what was the it guano doing around the water yeah. or? Yeah. Yeah, definitely around all the, the guano reserves, there's a big um, nitrogen dumping around this. And some people say, hey, it's great for the kelp, right? So we have great kelp forests. And so the relationship between guano and kelp forests is a, a, a big uh, potential, yeah. And now I showed you also the amounts of guano from pictures from way back. This is definitely uh, gone down with the numbers of birds that we now have, but it's about um, 20, 20,000 uh, tons per year is what they harvest. Yeah. Yes? I was curious if maybe like there could be some kind of compromise with the fishing industry and like uh, maybe like rising, trying to rise, sorry, increase seabird populations where maybe like it, depending where they could fish or a lot, where that, that, that could maybe like not, 
not harm seabirds so then they can yeah. increase in certain areas certain points of the year no that's that's great and that's exactly what um, we try and do with the pieces of information uh, that we get with the industrial fisheries with the anchoveta because of how it works and it's a person it's a big net that they find the anchovy and they put it up it's like a, a bag and everything that's in that bag gets taken out so um, it's really hard because the they're all looking for the same thing even you know, fishermen look for birds to know where the boat is going to go to go fish. So with the industrial, it's hard. We have a really good case in, in Marcona with fishermen that want to work towards sustainable use of resources. So with smaller artisanal boats that maybe are not, don't have that much economic pressure, it's not a big company, they're looking for alternatives of things to do. And so we're, we want to what we want to do is take this that step and our information is those things like don't use the nets in this time of the year because the penguins will really benefit and Marcona can benefit from sustainable tourism at a great reserve where others can come and see penguins. So it's kind of the other incentives we can use to work with people. Yes. I was wondering, I, I wasn't paying enough attention to the slide with the El Ninos. Yeah. Um, are they increasing in frequency? I understand that it's a natural occurrence. Yeah. But are they increasing? Do you think they might be increasing in frequency because of climate change? Yeah. I mean, the thing with the with climate change is just uh, everything's now is more unpredictable, right? And we have had it, it does coincide that everyone's waiting for that big El Nino because we had 82 and now we have 97 and it's 15 years. So we're right now we're overdue and 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 but. With all the climate change, it's very unpredictable. And um, although El Nino was the best studied like climate signal, now every year, you know, the scientists, ah, everyone starts El Nino, El Nino, El Nino, and then it doesn't really develop into El Nino. And right now, if you read the blogs and all that stuff online, that's what they're saying. It's like, we can't predict it because it's all the patterns are changing. Yeah. Thank you, Susanna, very much. Uh, Anyone else would like to ask questions? We can do a little bit later.